globalization before. We used to be ruled by a British Empire that con controlled 85% of the territories of the world. And our freedom movement was a deglobalization movement. Uh, it was Gandhi pulling out his charta and saying, we will make our own clock and we will not be enslaved to a textile industry which takes our raw materials and then sells back to you. It's the point that Barbara made. Uh, this is the year, interestingly, of a hundred years of Gandhi's joining the freedom movement in India after he came back from South Africa um, and joining this um, non-cooperation with the compulsory planting of indigo, which is like a slave system. So I've just finished the pilgrimage of the hundred years of the non-cooperation, the Satyagraha. It's called the Champaran Satyagraha, the fight for truth. Um, we need this even more. Because in addition to the slavery entailed, there is the huge impact of a globalized system on the planet. So much of the ecological footprint. Soya coming from Brazil in the Hamburg port, it has a footprint. And we need to assess that. The destruction of livelihoods. Because Every time corporations take over any sector, whether it be clothing and textiles or farming and food, they have to destroy local livelihoods. And I think one of the problems I have with the G20 is it's part of this conspiracy of silence about livelihoods. The only thing they talk is jobs. And the word job during the Industrial Revolution used to mean cheated. You were jobbed when you were picked up from your farm and pushed into a coal mine or you were jobbed when you were taken into a textile industry, the word job had a negative connotation. Lives, livelihoods, work, meaning, is what we should bring back in our vocabulary. Yes, they asked. It's not the case that there are uniform uh, relationships. It's not that all the Sherpas are equally obedient. Uh, some have pressure from the base. That's democracy. And wherever there is stronger democracy, and there is less of the convergence of corporate power and political power, which is what Mussolini called fascism. Um, that is where the tensions come up. That is where the ability to open up spaces comes up. I find Europe has more spaces than the US just now. Um, I think one of the big challenges with deglobalization in our times is, and I, I hear this from uh, people in Europe, because you haven't been through the kind of freedom movement we went through, which was on economic terms, of breaking free of an economic empire, uh, when the right wing rises and cultural nationalism rises, you cannot distinguish between cultural nationalism, which is hate, and economic sovereignty which is about. It depends. I want to read out a wonderful quote from Gandhi um, on this. He warned that patriotism born on hate, killeth, and patriotism based on love, giveth life. And the reason he was killed, the reason he was killed was he was a nationalist, but a nationalist based on love. And there were those who were promoting hate. I want to mention just one thing about this. What's happening increasingly is a convergence between a politics of hate and an economics of globalization. This is what Trump is practicing. This is sadly what my country is practicing. You might have heard about the power which you and the lynchings in India. The law that's being written is actually a law to totally criminalize the Indian small farmer livestock economy. Because I've had to deal with seeds all the time, I understand what a particular law prohibiting exchange and trade between local communities means. Uh, they even have clauses forbidding the decoration of the animals. We decorate our cows. We have festivals. We worship our cow. But right now, in the name of cow protection, they're killing humans. The true love of the cow is defend the earth to which the cow gives, defend the cow, defend the humans, defend community. And I really feel the big challenge we face because sadly, in spite of talking new technologies all the time, at the end of the day, 
the billionaires are only eyeing our food. <laughs> that, that's the biggest source of profit, whether it's the seed or it's the production or it's the processing or it's the trade. So the more we defend our seed freedom and food freedom as the deglobalization, the better quality we will have, the more livelihoods there will be, the less planetary destruction and the deeper ability to deal with the new fascism that is rising everywhere. Uh, I think the issue of work is going to be one of the most challenging aspects, both because the industrial world has a huge burden of very narrow understandings of it. The word work is expenditure of energy. That's what it means in science. But when I travel to our communities, I remember we were having a meeting on tribal self rule, a law we got, and then the government violated it. That's when the killings and shootings had started, and tribal India is a war zone now. But before all this started, and we were planning this self rule, this older man got up and um, started to leave. I said, What happened? Where are you going? Oh, it is time for me to beautify the earth. That's how he described farming. Because no one was making him work. He was choosing to work and he was beautified farming. In, for the weavers of India, there is no word called work. They call it play. Because when they are making their designs, it is as, you know, they, they're doing art. They're creating beautiful work and becoming one with it. So I see work as co-creation and co-production with the earth and her amazing capacities. And I do not think, I do not think human beings are full human beings if they are not given that opportunity. That is why before we accept universal unemployment, hiding behind the Trojan horse of people accepting a universal baking income that somehow those who created injustice and destroyed our right to work will be the ones who will give us securities, those who stole our farms, our livelihoods, our health, our democracy, are the ones who are suddenly going to give, come and give us new freedom. I just think we should think more about it and really not only defend the current right to work, in the International Labour Organization, but also create new meaningful work. You know, I, I built up an Earth University at Nagania, and we get young people from around the world. The other day, young 18 year old from France who just left school, he said, I never felt happy. Working with the Earth? I couldn't imagine how much joy that this can give me, putting my hands in the soil. So, we need to do that. Then the issue was tools. For me, the issue of tools is it is a means. We have intelligence to assess when we need which means. If I need a plow, I should use a plow, which should not be made illegal. I shouldn't be forced to buy a caterpillar tractor. I shouldn't be forced to harvest with a combined harvester, which is leaving huge straws in our fields and leading to burning. Artificial intelligence is a wrong phrase. Because intelligence is to choose in an embodied way. That's where it's derived from. Interlegre. The ability to choose. When a weed in a roundup ready field becomes a super weed, it is acting intelligently. When a bug in our gut is developing resistance to antibiotics, it's acting intelligently. Being able to do a few computational steps with a lot of data is not intelligence, it is computation. It is still fast computation with lots of data. It doesn't change in the elevation. We have a beautiful word for intelligence in my language. It's buddhi. I think buddha is derived from it. Buddhi means the ability to judge truth from falsehood, right from wrong, and choose the right livelihood path according to that judgment. Your Siri, Siri, her name is Siri, and Alexa, they can't do that. They can just help you, you know, order the next consumer good, or tell you someone's calling you, or take your instructions, call someone. Uh, they're basically lazy artifacts to make you lazier. 
Um, I think this externalization, uh, let me put it this way, assumption that by talking artificial intelligence, human beings will give up their last freedom and their last ability to choose will be an ultimate slavery. So I'm not saying if you need to use a computer, don't use a computer. But do not allow someone else to enslave you through that computer. If you can use a phone, use the phone. But I think we must organize to prevent governments from using smartphones. Uh, it's happening in India, and I'm watching it. And I, the other day, a minister had to climb a tree. Because the only way we can do transactions in some places is with the phone. But there was no signal. So the poor guy had climbed the tree to get the signal to order his food for that day. Um, intelligence is just all over. The earth is intelligence. That's what uh, the Gaia piece of theory is about. The roots of the plants are brilliantly intelligent. They can identify where there's glyphosate, they can identify where there's fertilizer, they can identify where there's good humus. In one root of one plant, there is more neurological activity going on than in a human brain. And our gut, our gut is now being called the second brain, the enteronervous system. Because it's from here that the other brain that we gave importance to is working. Why is it important to recognize these multiple intelligences? Because that's what gets destroyed when there's a bigger assault of chemicals, a bigger assault of surveillance from far away, and the person who's dealing with the Silicon Valley biops for Monsanto said the other day there are only two groups of people, two people who need surveillance systems and spyware, the CIA and Monsanto. <laughs> Immediately after the people's movements were successful in shutting down the World Trade Organization ministerial in, um, in Seattle, and IFG, with whom we organized something with Patrick in, uh, 10 years after the Earth Summit, um, Zolik, who was then the Trade Secretary, who later became head of World Bank, wrote an article precisely on this that there is no difference between terrorists connecting 9-11 and those who protest neoliberal policies. And it did give a chilling effect to our colleagues in the US. Sadly, that's where the anti-globalization movement really went down. Um, that's why one of the most important things we need to do is not be silenced. We know in this period, whatever you like to call them, sheriffs, whatever, they are actually desperate. They're desperate because they made so much money out of nothing in 20 years. You know, out of nothing. They just had patents, they collected royalties, they speculated on other people's money, got people into prices with the subprime prices and the secret. Everything they've done is with no work. And Gandhi actually had a beautiful thing saying the seven sins, and one of the sins was wealth without work. These new rubber barons have wealth without work. And I think we need to not just not be criminalized, which is where solidarity comes into place very importantly, but we have to name them as the criminals, which is why... All of us who are dealing with Monsanto, whether it be Brazil or it be Argentina or Mexico or Canada or Europe, we organized a tribunal on Monsanto and a people's assembly. And interestingly, when the later assembly was held, uh, and by uh, Bernard Dyer is here, I guess Bayer, because Bayer is merging with Monsanto, Bayer tried to have protests declared as terrorists in the city of Bonn. So this is going to happen and we must continue to use what skills we have to name the ecocide and the genocide that is underway. We, all of us in this room, have that privilege. You're not like that farmer who's in such deep debt that he goes and drinks a bottle of poison in the slab. And so we have an additional duty. At home in India, we have built on our freedom movement's concepts of self-rule and self-organization calls for our 
and we have built the seed freedom, the food freedom, and prevented four attempts by the current government to take away the land of the peasantry, to hand over globally, to say, come make in India. Take what land you want, do what you want, I'll give it for free to you. We have prevented that land grab. The issue of self-making, as I mentioned already, in the area of agriculture and food, the systems we are building for our freedom are so much more superior, whether it be health for quality or employment or mitigating climate change. Finally, I think the power to say no. Power to say no in our minds to not get seduced by the new narratives of a linear inevitable history, to know we will shape our history. But the power to say no because there is only one way we'll be able to enclose our commons and the economy of today is about enclosing our commons and extracting and mining from it. Whether it be mining the genetic data from a seed or it be mining water or it be mining our social relationships on Facebook. They call it data mining for big data. Uh, that's the raw material on which this edifice is built. Defending our commons means we A, stick to the real world and don't allow our lives to be commodified. And the power to say no to this is very important. In Nepali, we organize a course every year since 2000 on how you deal with globalization, with the ideas that got us freedom in the early part of the century. The course is called Gandhi Globalization and Gross National Happiness to Redefine Wealth as well be. It's at the end of October, early November. And uh, any of you who want more details, come and talk to me, and I'll be very happy to share with you. Uh, I, let me just end with two things. First, there are a pathetic group of 20 Sherpas working with a pathetic group of eight peeps. Now, that's a very weak point to begin with. Then they build their path on fabrication and fabrication and alternative fact after alternative fact. Let's stick to our truth and our solidarity. We are strong.